I would try and do my best to keep you awake for next 30 minutes since it's post lunch. Uh, but I hope uh, you know you would be able to enjoy this uh, next 30 minutes uh, because I'm going to talk of something which is slightly different that you, you normally hear. Uh, today I'm going to talk about automotive user experience and how that word is completely different than what we are otherwise used to as a designer, designing for mobiles, designing for tablets, you know, designing applications for banks and finance and stuff like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a completely different challenge or it's a completely different world which I'm going to make a very limited attempt to just expose you. Let's look at uh, uh, you know, what we're going to cover in this session very, very briefly. We're going to talk of evolutionary perspective in terms of how cars or the interfaces in cars are evolved. We're going to talk of uh, you know, what are the real user stories or you know, what, what are the user perspectives. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about why it is so challenging to deal with automotive infotainment and of course how technology is shaping the automotive infotainment as we go along. So let's take a quick ride back to the history. Uh, you know, uh, since uh, Henry Ford uh, did this Model T for the first time, uh, you know, for the, for the early drivers, uh, you know, they would for all you know be thinking, you know, it might be better, easier riding a horse than riding a car. Uh, because essentially it was a backbone of a car that was evolved or, you know, that, that we started with. But if you look at chronological history in say, for example, 1901, there was a speedometer and there's an odometer. For the first time, cars were, you know, giving a feedback and on what speed, we, uh, you know, they're going at. You cut across a couple of decades later, uh, you know, cars have evolved to be a relatively stable piece of machinery and you start using it prevalently and then, you know, next level of urges would start in terms of, you know, while I'm driving all the way, you know, can I, can I, can I keep a track of the football match that is happening or, do I, you know, can I, can I hear radio? So it's a simple things like clocks and radios, those were integrated in cars in about 1930s. And then came an era wherein, you know, it was fun, it was a pleasure to go on the car, uh, you know, in the cars, uh, uh, you would start enjoying the rides. But then suddenly, you know, cities became populated, uh, roads started choking, and uh, you, your urge as a, as a consumer would start evolving. Uh, you know, you would still say, people are saying, you know, it's fun, you, you can go easily in the ride, but it's, it's not that easy. And that's when things like Climate control has evolved, wherein you know trying to make it slightly comfortable for you inside the car, having AC. Uh, that's when these automatic gear shifts evolved. That's when some of these new infotainment functionalities, uh, like cassette player, which were in the hope. Uh, so you suddenly have a freedom of listening the music that you want to listen, and you are no more dependent on radio uh, only. Uh, Machines became faster, infrastructure become better, and suddenly speeds uh, increased. Number of vehicles on the roads increased, and you know you are wondering, is it really safe? Uh, I'm I'm going at this high speed, and uh, you know there are so many of these cars uh, going around me. That's where some of the safety considerations started coming into play. So things like airbags and some of the other, uh, if I can say, uh, safety constraints and provisions, ECU. Uh, you know, uh, engine control unit, a uh, kind of a digital brain of uh, the car, uh, which controls the entire car's functionality, be it engine and transmission, they started becoming prevalent in 1990s. If you can track, CD player was invented at that point of time, and it didn't take much for CD player to come into the car straight away. And then comes the era, you know, wherein uh, everything that you wish from a car is already there in a car. Uh, and you're looking to explore what else can I do inside the car. And you started looking at some of the use case scenarios in terms of, you know, I need to go from point A to point B. There are these big maps for me. But, you know, I'm, I'm still struggling to interpret those maps. I'm still struggling to... Uh, get the direction, so is, you know, can cars take me or can cars assist me from taking me to point A to point B, and that was the era of millennial, if I can call it. 
so if you look at it, uh, navigation system started becoming a default functions of features in the car. Uh, if you can relate, internet by then was extremely pre prevalent. It was no more, uh, uh, you know, restricted to privileged few. Uh, few. BlackBerry was uh, in that era, and you know that's the era when we started talking of you know my laptop has this processor and it is faster and stuff like that. So things were getting better, things were getting efficient, faster, and cut across today. Uh, if you if you look at the journey in terms of how uh, consumer habits have evolved the last uh, uh, 100, or 100 or years or so, uh, you will certainly notice uh, that uh, the consumers today have changed quite drastically. They are online all the time. Uh, they take technology for granted. Uh, the adaptation of technology or prevalence of technology in your houses, in your bedrooms, your halls, your offices, is phenomenal. You cannot spend five minutes of your life uh, without having to indulge in one or other point of a technology. That's today. So you suddenly have, uh, you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and uh, you virtually wanting to remain connected at all point of time. So, how does how does the current technological landscape or uh, the landscape of digitization uh, reflect in cars? If you look at it, it's it's a it's car is evolving from a mechanical product to a completely digital product or a completely digital platform. And let's let's look at it uh, in terms of how it is happening. If you look at IC engine or the engine which is which is supposed to be heart of the car, and if you look at how it evolved over the period of uh, last century. It's it's fairly incremental change. You know, there's still a piston, there is still a, a cylinder, there's still a crankshaft, uh, and okay, you keep on adding bits and bits of technology to make it more efficient, make it more robust, and so on, so forth. But if you look at it, the advances in mechanical technology of the car are fairly evolutionary in nature. So what is it that is changing in last uh, in say, uh, last 10 or 20 years? It's essentially the brain of the car. It's essentially the electronic or a digital technology of the car that somehow is revolutionizing the way we look at cars today. Uh, do you consider car as, uh, as something that takes you from point A to point B? Uh, visualize yourself uh, you know, for going to buy a particular car in a dealership and then let's look at uh, what is it that you would seek from a car. You would notice. Uh, that your expectations or as a consumer the things that you would qualify uh, that your car should have is, is going to be a pretty long list. A lot of it uh, touching your life, uh, what you are or who you are in various ways. Essentially you are, uh, if I can say, you are looking at car as your alter ego as a reflection of who you are and uh, you know statement of who you are. So. Uh, what do consumer expects in today's cars? Uh, uh, virtually everything that you can think of. I would like my car to be the best music system that I can ever have and believe me, in many houses for many people, the most technologically advanced equipment for music they would have is possibly their cars. Uh, you would expect your car to be your phone, you would expect your car to be your computer, you would expect your car to be your laptop. Uh, Increasingly, people are expecting car to be their healthcare devices and so on and so forth. So, it's the amount of uh, demand that normal consumers are putting on car as a product are, are, are rising extremely fast. But with that, uh, the challenges are rising as well. Just imagine a scenario. Uh, what? I'm sure you can relate to these images. Just uh, try and visualize what are the things that people do inside the car. Uh, you know, people who do makeup, they would paint uh, their nails, uh, they would take a call, they would eat, they will text. We have had instances wherein, uh, you know, people changing diapers in a car while driving. Uh, there was a survey in, done in America which says that any typical American car, it's 65% 
of the female users of the car, they literally treat it as its makeup room or makeup van or vanity kit in some sense. So what is happening in the process? Uh, when you drive a car, you know, you're going at a very high speed. Uh, there are a lot of other objects traveling around you at that high speed. So ideally, all your senses should uh, only be directing towards uh, driving. Uh, but you should have your hands on steering wheel, your eyes should be on the road, uh, and all your ears should be, uh, you know, on anything that you would hear on the road. Does that happen? No. I think... Uh, it's it's the multiplexing behavior. It's it's the behavioral shift, uh, which says that you know I I can do four things, five things at a time simultaneously, and that is kind of impacting uh, one's own ability to drive, because suddenly you're subjecting your drivers to massive amount of cognitive load, all of which all of your brain's energy should ideally be channelized on the only driving function, but that's not really happening. So let's look at, uh, in, a, in a systemic manner, some of the components uh, of automotive HMI. Uh, you know, there are certain inputs that are being given by a car. You would, you would, do, you would take uh, specific actions, uh, which would be seen as outputs. So for example, increasing a volume of a radio could be output of an action wherein you, know, you turn volume lap. Uh, so you, you look at all the use case scenarios. And if you try and visualize your use case scenarios, uh, you can categorize them as primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary related to only driving functions. Secondary possibly needing to your infotainment needs, your uh, vehicle system needs and stuff like that. But beyond that, tertiary need like having to text or having to tweet while driving. Uh, and you would, you would virtually try and use every system uh, that is available inside the car in terms of displays, the controls which are there on the steering wheel and so on and so forth. So just to visually capture, uh, there are this huge density of controls uh, suddenly that you are dealing with. There is huge amount of data of varied nature you are trying to process. Uh, so you are staying and on steering wheel you would virtually want to have everything uh, because your hands can really not be off the steering wheel. There is a cluster that is constantly showing you information uh, related to speed and directions and so on and so forth. So let's look at some of these components in a slightly granular manner. If you look at instrument clusters itself, you know, traditionally they're supposed to be just speedometer, odometer, and then telling RPMs and so on and so forth, et cetera. What's happened over the period of time is you had, you had these analog dials. They have been increasingly getting replaced uh, with uh, complete digital TFT screens. And you suddenly have literally a computer uh, sitting in front of you behind your steering wheel, and you have completely if I can put it this way, reconfigurable real estate. So for example, if you are driving and uh, a call comes, you do not have to look at uh, your central infotainment screen. You, you can see the notification on the cluster itself. Or if you, are, if you want to access your playlist for the music, really it's all about uh, you know, ensuring that driver can uh, devote as much as mental space to primary function that is driving. And how do you, how do you assist? Uh, him in doing that. So, uh, for example, this and this is part of exactly the same screen. It's just that depending upon the context, uh, the display of the instrument cluster is changing. Uh, similarly, infotainment uh, screens. If, if you look at it, this is Tesla, uh, one of the complete uh, electrical car. It's, it's possibly the most digital piece of car uh, that is there today. And they have, if I can put it this way, gone whole hog in trying to put massive uh, size display inside the car and virtually as good as trying to put your computer inside your car. Now it's debatable in terms of whether that's the right strategy to do. Are you, are you going to provide such a big screen inside the car itself? And is it going to really distract users in terms of uh, you know, having to focus on the screen as against on the road, I do not think as an industry, I mean, throughout the automotive industry, people have answered or arrived at the right answers. If, if I can look at it from all uh, manufacturers, everybody currently is in a state of flux wherein people are toying with multiple technologies, multiple ideas. 
let's look at some of the most prevalent ones. As a direct input on infotainment system, you have all the touch screens, wherein there is a screen, you can actually touch on the screen, and if at all, you know, you can use limited browsing behaviors, swipings, etc., to scroll through the list. Far evolved systems are some of the indirect systems wherein we're trying to have intelligent rotaries, wherein uh, the rotaries are mapped to the content onto the screen. So I do not have to reach to the screen. Screen is away in the distance. Screen is positioned slightly high at the top so that I do not have to look inside my uh, you know, car interior so that my eyes are as much as on the road. Screens are positioned way above on the dash, but controls are placed uh, very near uh, to my hands where I can access them. So actions, either five-way key or rotating browsing on these controls is, is related to what I see on the display or, uh, you know, something which is there in Mercedes, uh, there is a touchpad that would allow me to, for example, if I, if I need to dial, uh, uh, say, Sam, I, I, I can have a gesture uh, of writing Sam S, and then it will throw me a list of, uh, you know, contact list starting with S, and so on and so forth. Uh, similarly for Audi. So people have been experimenting in various major rotary controls or combination of rotary and touch-enabled surfaces, uh, as an alternate methodology uh, to looking at a purely touch interfaces, people have been experimenting with voice HMIs. And once again, it's none of these technologies are fairly foolproof because you can imagine if there are four people driving inside the car, would voice HMI be effective? Or if your music system is playing, would voice system be effective? Necessarily no. Uh, so, you know, there are various ways in which people are interpreting uh, voice HMIs, you know. There's an instruction that is come, uh, you know, that comes up on screen, and I just have to mimic the instruction. There are systems which people are trying to evolve, wherein, say, for example, if I want to play music, it should be very natural, very intuitive to me. So I can say play music or run music or just start music. All the spoken language, all the spoken ways in which I can give command to the system, saying that okay, just start music. Uh, can system understand all the syntax uh, and still play the music? so that I am not uh, restricting user to learn a specific behavior or say personalization uh, in the command. So wherein I, I can define my own voice commands. But like I mentioned earlier, there are challenges with respect to languages, dialects, accents. Uh, sorry, I'm going to jump one slide ahead. If you look at uh, gesture interfaces, uh, so if you look at in addition to touch and voice, people have been experimenting gestures. Uh, imagine that you need to increase volume uh, you know, while playing music in your car. W what is the best thing to do? Would you reach to the screen and try and uh, you know, uh, uh, increase the volume up? Or is it very convenient just for me in the air, uh, you know, in air to just have a vertical swipe to say increase the volume? Can I, can I relate? very natural gesture made in air uh, for some functions which are which is very amenable to those. So people have been exp uh, you know, experimenting with gestures, uh, like I mentioned even earlier, on the surfaces or free floating in the air. Uh, once again, it's a technology which is evolving and it is currently limited by the constraints of hardware. So for example, if there's a camera looking at me and recording my gesture, it depends on the, uh, shall we say, parabola of camera and fidelity of camera and the ability of algorithm to interpret my gestures correctly. So uh, if you look at all the things that one, one would do inside the car, uh, what becomes very apparent is, uh, is there is no one way of interface, there is no one way of interacting with the car. Uh, which would which would be ideal for all scenarios. Essentially, any user experience that we would build inside the car has to be multimodal uh, experience, has to be the experience uh, which is a combination of multiple ways of interacting with systems, uh, uh, which suits best for the given scenario. Essentially, uh, you know, you are coming back to the same thing. Uh, you are you are providing appropriate cognitive tools, appropriate cognitive ways to interact with the system. Now, having, having learned, uh, you know, uh, some of the basics of what automotive interfaces are, let's, 
let's look at how it is evolving today or how it would evolve uh, sometime in near future You know, the entire world is today talking of mobile apps and there are zillions of them already on all the operating platforms. There are going to be millions of them added uh, to the bandwagon. These are going to be a special kind of mobile apps which would interact with the car. So increasingly you do not have to be inside your car or you do not have to only interact with car control panel to really interact with your car. You would be able to interact with your car using your mobile phones. Uh, you would be able to do various, uh, if, if, if we do a two minutes of a brainstorming session here, you'll get like at least 10 ideas of what you can do on your mobile phone, uh, you know, for car. So people have been doing a lot of things. So for example, in EV cars, uh, checking the battery status or finding the nearest fuel pump or planning your journey, going beyond navigation, using your mobile phones. Or, like I mentioned, uh, Controlling cars uh, from other ancillary devices, which, which is which is becoming increasingly a norm. So let's look at who is spending their bigger energy on designing automotive interfaces. And you would imagine it is General Motors and Fords and BMWs and Audis of the world. There are few new players who are trying to have their share of pie. Some of you will be able to relate to these images. Some of you might know. But it's the usual suspect. Android is investing heavily on designing their own operating system, their own ways of uh, interacting with car or virtually say operating system Android for cars. And so is Apple CarPlay. So uh, the battle between tech giants themselves is shifting from mobile phone to cars in some sense. And if you look at the amount of automotive players who have been signing up or you know explicitly declaring themselves to be in camp A versus camp B, you realize plenty of them. And unlike the mobile world, you would see people are not able to make choices. So there are people who are betting simultaneously on Android as well as Apple. So some of the emerging technologies, uh, uh, so for example, vehicle to vehicle communication, Heads up display, eventually things that will come up as an overlay on your screen. Appization of the car and a lot of you would know. It's an it's autonomous car that, that, is, that is by Google, uh, which would, you know, which would drive by itself. A lot of these technologies, a uh, lot of player have in experimental form in one or other way. Uh, people have been trying to deal with uh, regulatory challenges to figure out how to they come into the market. So I'm going to give you a very brief cursory of notes of what we are doing in that space. Not, uh, you know, we've been working quite extensively for a long amount, long point of time. So for example, this is one of the interface we did, which multiplexes between touch mode and gesture mode. Something, you know, a button, if I look at it, it is enable for me to touch versus something which is in a virtual space that intuitively tells me, you know, it's a virtual space. Uh, one of the show car which we done in 2010 for Beijing Auto Show for uh, one of the client, uh, Tata Pixel, uh, one of the show car that was displayed in Geneva Auto Show, complete 3D instrument cluster, uh, voice HMIs, uh, you know, digital tree configurable instrument clusters, lots of other work. The last example. Uh, uh, we, we done this. Uh, we participated in this competition, and this particular entry happened to win the prize of best user experience. Very simple premise: uh, the functionalities inside the cars are going to go exponentially high, and the only way to deal with those is to try and exponentially keep on making your interface simpler and simpler. Thanks a lot. Essentially, all I'm saying is, car is becoming your next wearable device. You look at it in any perspective; it is the next wearable which you are dealing with. Thank you.